It's a great pleasure to announce the first talk this afternoon, Kevin O'Regan. Kevin's talks are always very inspiring, but given the experience of this morning, I would kindly ask you to uh, ask no questions in between, except if they're really necessary to understand the next step in the talk and um, postpone everything else into the discussion. Thank you very much. It's all yours. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to interactions with you mathematicians. Um, the work I'm going to be presenting was done with Alexander Terikov, who is a mathematician here. And uh, any questions, if you don't understand it, it's all his fault, he will answer. And we have a poster that you can go and see over there. Uh, you can also ask him about it. Uh, we also have a doctoral student, Alban Laflaquière, that we're working with. And the work that I'm gonna talk about is based on the work, uh, uh, on my book, uh, which is a book about consciousness and about the question of why when we see something or feel something, it feels the way it does rather than some other way. For example, why red feels like red rather than feeling like green or like, say, the sound of a bell. And one of the aspects of the theory is what I call the uh, sensory motor approach, and this sensory motor approach uh, is, uh, can be extended to understand the notion of space. And this is what I want to do today, is show how a sensory motor approach can be applied to the notion of space. So let me start with a concrete example. What is a straight line? What is a straight line? If you look at a straight line, it projects as a great arc at the back of your eye, and if you flatten out the retina, it see, you see it as a straight line, right? But now if you move your eye off the straight line, it projects as a different great arc at the back of your eye. And now if you flatten out the retina, you see that the straight line is no longer straight, it's curved. So why do the lines look straight? If they can look curved depending on your eye position. Actually, the situation is worse than this. And it's, it's worse than this because um, Ah, what's going on here? It takes hours to change. It's, the situation is worse because these straight lines on the retina. So the situation is worse because the straight lines are being sampled by the photoreceptors at the base of the retina, and these are not uh, um, uh, concentrated in a homogeneous fashion. They're more densely packed in the center, symbolized by these small triangles, and they are more sparsely packed in the peripheral retina, and they get replaced by rods symbolized by these disks. And so actually the cortical representation of the two straight lines is very distorted. Now you might ask, how is it that we can see straight lines as straight when in fact the representation we have in the brain is something like this? How do we see them as of equal thickness all along their length, as equally spaced all along their length, as being straight, uh, when in fact we have this distortion? Now, you might think that uh, a way of solving the problem would be to uh, recalibrate essentially the metric of the cortical uh, representation. But the trouble with that idea is that you would have to have an a priori knowledge, you would have to have some demon inside the brain that knew in advance what straight lines are supposed to look like in order to make this recalibration. But there is actually a different way of looking at straight lines and understanding what they are, which solves the problem. If you think about what a straight line is from a mathematical point of view, one aspect of straight lines is the fact that a straight line is a thing such that when you move along it, it looks the same as, it, as before you moved. So this is a definition which I would call is sensory motor because you move and you see the changes and you check what the changes are and if there's no change, you know it's a straight line. If you consider this definition, look what happens. So here's the visual field. Your straight line is being sampled by photoreceptors on your retina and this is being put into the cortical representation which is all distorted. Now, if you move along the straight line with your eye, the line slides underneath the photoreceptors, and so nothing happens to the activity in the cortex. 
But if you move in any other direction, move across it, different uh, uh, retinal receptors will now be stimulated by the straight line, and you will get a completely different change. You'll get a large change in the activity in the cortex. So if you think about what you mean by a straight line in intrinsic mathematical terms, in sensory motor terms, in fact, you say we have, you see that we have a definition of the straight line which, which is independent of the cortical wiring and which allows you to distinguish straight lines from other things uh, independently of what the cortical representation is. So for example, if some monster will come, would come and chew up the uh, optical nerve and mix all things up, and the cortical uh, representation were totally exploded, okay? Or if the retina, for example, was not flat, but was corrugated or completely distorted in some way, everything I say here would still apply, okay? Everything I've said is independent of the cortical representation. It's an intrinsic definition of straight lines. So I've just shown you how identifying straight lines in this way allows us to escape from the the problem of the way information is coded in the brain. And um, uh, by doing this, I've made use of what I call a sensory motor dependency or sensory motor contingency uh, uh, in defining what I mean by straight lines. Um, sensory motor contingencies are laws linking actions to sensory changes. The idea of calling them sensory motor contingencies came from a cybernetician, Donald Mackay, back in the 1960s. And it was also used in the paper that I published with uh, the philosopher Alva Noe. And the whole point about sensory motor contingencies is that they represent intrinsic properties of the world that are independent of the sensor code. Now, the argument I made about straight lines is just a specific case uh, of a much more general question about how the brain perceives all aspects of our, uh, of our sensory world. Okay? To understand the full complexity of the problem that the brain is faced with when it's looking at the world outside, consider the following analogy. Imagine that you are an engineer in a surface vessel uh, controlling an underwater robot that is exploring the remains of the Titanic. And imagine a um, villainous aquatic monster that comes and chews up the, the cable. And now all the information on the dials and, and lights and meters on, uh, on the dashboard here are completely confused. And when you push the lever that is supposed to make the, the, uh, the robot advance, actually what happens is that the fuel leaks out of the, out of the fuel containers and everything is completely mixed up. So this is really the situation that you have to imagine that the brain is in. The brain is sitting inside its bony cavity there in the dark and there's millions of sensory inputs coming and millions of sensory of motor outputs going, and a priori, at least uh, from an evolutionary point of view, there is no information about what is outside in the world, and somehow some sense has to be made out of that. So as an example, imagine that this is what the engineer in the surface vessel sees on one of the monitors, okay? And a second later, he sees this. Now is this change from here to here? What is this change? This, this structure here that the engineer sees, is it, uh, the, does it correspond to a rigid displacement of the whole agent within under, underwater there? Is it some fish that is moved by the, uh, the, the, the sensors of the agent? Is it a change in shape of some outside object? Or is it just a change of internal state of the, of the, of the, of the underwater robot, like the fuel uh, changing, okay? How can we distinguish between these different types of change that the robot feels or senses? So William James called this problem the problem of the blooming, buzzing confusion that the brain is faced with from all the sensory inputs. How can you make space of this? How can you make sense of this? How can the robot s understand that it is immersed in this thing called space? Where is space in this blooming, buzzing confusion? How can the robot understand that it is immersed in an environment and that it has a body separate from the environment and that in the environment there are objects and that the body is one of those objects? How can it get this notion that space is a vessel, a kind of empty vessel in which all these things are immersed? How can it see that from this stuff that it gets on the, on the confused and scrambled uh, uh, sensory inputs? This is a problem 
that the brain is faced with, either in the development of the individual in ontogeny, or it's a problem that must be solved somehow through evolution on the evolutionary time scale, to, so as to wire up the brain so that it's able to do the, this, this, to solve this problem. So the question arises is, how is it possible from this mass of information to extract these notions of space? Now, one approach that you might consider uh, using uh, to answer the question would be a statistical or information theoretic approach, okay? So I think this would allow you to get certain kinds of information about the relation of the agent with the environment. Uh, in particular, by looking at the degree of control that the agent has on its sensory input, you would be able to distinguish three kinds of sensory input, proprioception, interoception, and extraoception. So proprioception really is information that tells the agent uh, the position of its limbs and things like that. And this is intimately linked to the changes in its limb position uh, produced by its voluntary uh, uh, actions. So the agent, if it's able to have actions, it's able, it will notice that there, it has complete control through its own actions of the changes caused by, on its proprioceptors. So it can distinguish proprioception from other types of sensations. Interoception, it has no control over interoception. If it has a digestive system, the digestion just goes on all by itself, and any action, voluntary actions that the agent has does not affect the sensory input it gets from interoception. So that's another characteristic that distinguishes interoception from proprioception. And then extraoception, that is information about the outside world, is halfway between those two degrees of, of control. So I think a statistical or information theoretic approach would allow the agent to distinguish this kind of sensory input. Another thing that statistics and information theory uh, would allow you to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to understand is the sensory topology uh, that the agent has that it gets from its sensory metric. So the agent could look at the metric that it has in its sensors and, and study the topology of the sensory manifold that it obtains, and from that get a, a notion of the proximity of the different types of sensory input. But such a topology would apply equally well to its internal states and has nothing intrinsically to do with outside space. It has no way of uh, make, making the link between this topology that it gets using the metric of its own sensors to actual external uh, space. Topology of sensors is not space. So what is space? Now, intuitively, uh, as I've been saying, space is uh, something, a kind of vessel in which we as agents are immersed and in which the uh, objects of the environment are also immersed. It's, a, it's something shared between the environment and myself. Um, and, and, the qu and so the question is, how can the agent extract this uh, this notion of space hidden in the, uh, in the sensory motor um, buzzing confusion. And how can it do this without knowing a priori that a thing such as space exists? I mean, you could think that in the process of evolution, uh, the existence of space is not something a priori given to organisms, okay? They ha it has to somehow uh, be, be found in the sensory motor mass of information. You cannot assume when you try and understand how this can come about that it is given a priori. So to answer the question of what is space and how it could be, uh, how it could be uh, deduced from the sensory motor information, um, I'm gonna take a simple example. I it would be impossible to try and simulate a, a, a real agent with millions of sensory inputs and sensory outputs. So I'll take really the simplest case and take the following agent, which is a one-dimensional agent. This one-dimensional agent is sort of like a tray. Here's this tray here. And it has a kind of eye consisting of a single photoreceptor uh, that can be moved by a muscle here, labeled P, P for proprioception, S for sensory input. And this, this sensor, this photosensor, can move backwards and forwards, can scan, like a, like a normal human eye can scan space, uh, inside the body of the agent. And uh, 
the, uh, the whole agent, the tray thing, can hop to different places within the environment. Or uh, equivalently, I can consider the environment, which I here consider to be a one-dimensional extent of, of uh, lights, uh, which I symbolize by this star uh, above the agent. So it's a one-dimensional environment, one-dimensional agent that can hop around inside its one-dimensional environment and that can scan using its uh, purpose, uh, using its uh, muscle to move its sensor around. And we'll assume, using information theoretic or statistical methods, that the agent has already learnt to distinguish proprioception from uh, sensory input deriving directly from the photoreceptor. So let's have a look at what the agent sees. So first of all, as the agent scans with its photoreceptor backwards and forwards here, we know that the, that the, uh, that the uh, output of the photoreceptor will follow some law like this as a function of x physical space, uh, real sensor uh, physical space underneath the environment. The trouble is the agent does not know what physical space is. It has no notion of space at the moment. Okay? So x does not exist for the agent. All the agent has is P, proprioception. And the link between proprioception and physical space is some arbitrary complex link, nonlinear, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it doesn't matter. But what's important is that there is some uh, systematic link, and so we get some response from the photoreceptor as a function of changes in proprioception. So this is the scanning of the environment done uh, at, at, at one moment. And now let's assume that the agent hops to some unknown, through some unknown distance. And now let's look and see what happens when it's hopped. Uh, so now, relative to it, the environment has changed from position B to position B prime. And now let's look at what happens when the agent scans again. And, and, and seen from the outside, as physicists, we can look at the response of the agent. We have a curve like that, and we know that the new response, D prime here, is just a shifted replica of the previous response, D, because it's just determined by the, spati the relative spatial location of the sensor to the, to the environment. But again, unfortunately, the agent cannot know this because it has no notion of space, and it's measuring proprioception and not physical space, and proprioception is a completely unknown function of space, nonlinear, so what the uh, agent may measure is something quite different, and it's not parallel at all to, to what it measured previously. How can it make sense of this? Now, there is something that the agent will notice, which is very striking. And it is the fact that there's an over overlapping range of sensory values. Because the... Uh, um, if, if the agent has not hopped too far, there will be cases when the position of the sensor relative to the environment in case B uh, is the same as the, position, the relative position of the sensor in case B prime. If the sensor moves a bit over here, say, now it will be in the same position as it was before relative to. And so, in fact, the output of the sensor will actually be the same as it was before. And in fact, there will be a whole range of sensory values which are the same as before. Now, this may not seem surprising at all for this particular one-dimensional agent, but imagine that the agent had millions of sensory inputs. What I'm saying is that then what would happen is that all of those millions of sensory inputs at some point would be identical to what they were before for some other proprioceptive value. And that is something that's extremely odd. It's extremely noteworthy, and I suggest that the agent will take note of that. So, for example, uh, imagine that at this position, the agent uh, senses it, that this is proprioceptive value B, and that it receives this sensory stimulation when it's in environment B, and now the agent shifts position, there is, a, there is a proprioceptor position B prime where the sensory input from environment B prime is the same because the sensor is in the same relative location as it was before. So I can make a map, which I call phi. Uh, 
that links proprioception before to proprioception after the, the shift. And you see this function phi essentially allows the agent after the shift to compensate for the change caused by the shift. So when the agent jumps, there's a change in sensory input. And what the function phi tells you is what proprioceptive change the agent must make in order to compensate for that sensory change so that it, it, the sensory change is nulled. Okay? So I can make this function phi that defines these. Function phi defines the proprioceptive changes necessary to compensate the sensory change caused by a shift in the position of the agent with respect to its environment. Okay? And now I can map out this function phi for different proprioceptive values. It depends, of course, on proprioception because proprioception is a nonlinear uh, function of actual position. And the function phi depends on the particular shift. If, if there were different shifts, for different shifts, I get different function phi. There's a whole family of curves. OK. Now, a little bit more patience, and you'll see, lo and behold, space is going to emerge from this. Let's look at a different environment. Um, imagine that instead of having single light sources, I've got a more complicated kind of light source. And, I, and so the response of the, of the photoreceptor is something like this now. And now I can uh, recalculate my function phi in this new environment. Now, what do you expect? You'll get a whole new set of functions phi. Here are my new functions phi. Something odd happened. These functions phi are exactly the same as before. Why is that? Jürgen, why is that? Because the more input is compressible, the electricity is actually the chemical input is compressible, which means that there's a first object that expands the Not bad, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Good. I'll say it in a slightly different way. <laughs> the reason why the functions phi don't depend on the environment is because of the magic of space. You didn't say the magic. It's the magic of space. It's because space <laughs> is a thing that allows the position and relative location of entities within it to be defined without this interfering with the identity of the entities themselves. In particular, I'm reading this because it's difficult to understand, photoreceptors are sensitive to, to relative location of light sources with respect to themselves. If the environment moves to compensate this change, you must bring the photoreceptors back to the same relative position as they had before the environment moves. So because there is such a thing as space, this action does not depend on the content of the environment, but only on the extent of the shift. So here's the two environments. Yes? So what you're saying is that space emerges from the participation of the agent. Well, at, at least this particular aspect, I'll go on to look at other possible aspects of space. So uh, maybe I don't have to go through this. I've just said this. So I'm saying that, that the actions, these phi functions are compensable actions. They're independent of the environment. And they provide an economic description of the environmental changes. Because you might have thought that when there is an environmental change, that these functions would com completely change. But the fact is they don't. And so we have here an economic description of certain kinds of economic, uh, uh, certain kinds of, uh, e of environmental changes. It's a very large degree of reduction in degrees of freedom here than from what you would have expected. Because the because these are very high dimensional spaces. And here we, we only need, in this case, a one dimensional parametrization to describe the, 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 these phi functions. And also note that we're approaching something I said at the beginning of my talk. Namely, we have the intuition that space is something shared between the agent and the environment. And indeed, because of the notion of compensability, it is something shared between the agent and the environment. OK, now, um, what we want to do is check 
that this agent really has this notion of space. So what we really need to do is to test the agent somehow, give it a, something like the equivalent of a Turing test, a Turing test of spatial knowledge. So we're going to subject it to a series of psychophysical tests and see if it passes them. So we have to devise tests that, uh, that, uh, will, will, that essentially um, uh, capture all the notions of space that we think are typical, prototypical spatial notions. But I'm, I'm going to do this uh, our, with, with Albon and Al, with, uh, with uh, Alexandra and Alba Laflaquer. We've been doing simulations, and so we use actual, uh, more complicated agents to show you that this is not just uh, a story I'm telling for my simple agent, but it should work for any arbitrary agent. So here, in what I'm going to be showing you in the next few minutes, the agent will be a two-dimensional sort of flatland agent. Here's the agent. It's like a tray again. It has a retina inside it here, and this retina can, has nine photosensors, sensors, and it can move up and down and back and forth inside the body of the agent, okay? And then the agent can hop around inside the environment, and the environment is uh, composed of a two-dimensional sky, uh, starry, a set of starry skies uh, uh, above it, okay? So this, this agent, um, what does it see? Uh, analogous to what I was showing you before, we can look at the output of one of the photoreceptors uh, in, the, in the agent. It's a, it's a nine-dimensional uh, uh, space of, of sensory input uh, from the photoreceptors and an eight-dimensional set of, uh, of inputs from the proprioceptors. So the, the space that the agent occupies is extremely large. Um, so I can only show you kind of bits of it. And here is the, the, the output of one of the photoreceptors uh, as a function of proprioception. Now, when I say as a function of proprioception, proprioception is an eight-dimensional uh, space. Uh, the thing is, however, that because the retina can only move around in a two-dimensional uh, space, the, um, the actual set of proprioceptive activities must be constrained to a two-dimensional manifold within the eight-dimensional space. So if you look at the kind of unfolding of the 2D manifold of the proprioceptive inputs defined in this 8D proprioceptive space. It's 2D here, and you can look at each value of proprioception inside this un unfolded 2D manifold. Uh, uh, this is what this circle of, of lights looks like to the agent for one of the photoreceptors. So you see it's rather distorted, just like the retinal input for the eye is very distorted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the proprioceptor space here exactly? So is it, it's not the retina position uh, in the agent, or what is it exactly? Yes, it's the, uh, sorry, I should have explained better. The retina moves around inside the agent, and it activates as it gets closer to these proprioceptive cells. Uh, the closer it gets to one of the cells, the greater the activity is. So it's just an arbitrary uh, measure of the position of the, what we wanted was a very complicated, nonlinear, high dimensional uh, representation of the position of the retina within the body. Okay, so having got, so what we can do now is have the agent scan some environments and it can cons construct these functions phi uh, from uh, in the same way as I showed you before. So here is an example of the function phi uh, for um, the flatland agent um, for a particular shift. Um, and you see these arrows here show you uh, the, the compensatory proprioceptive shift that is necessary to compensate for the particular uh, sensory change that is produced by that, uh, uh, by that change in, in, by that particular shift in, in the environment or in the motion of the agent. So the, the agent has tabulated a whole host of these uh, functions phi for all sorts of different shifts. That's what it has in its memory now. And now we want to do our Turing test, or our, um, our test of spatial knowledge, um, uh, in which the agent is like the subject in a psychophysical experiment. We're going to ask it questions, and we want to see if, 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 the, if, if when through the answers that the agent gives, it, we can show that it has actually captured the notion of space. So the first test 
the first test, um, what we want to do is try and capture this idea of a vessel. So the idea of the vessel, really, what is this idea? The idea is that space is a thing um, in which, which is unchanged and that I can move as an agent, I can move in the space without this changing the space. And the thing is that, of course, when, when, when I move in the space, my sensory input changes dramatically. And somehow, despite this dramatic change, I must interpret this change as no change, essentially. Okay? On the other hand, so, so when the agent displaces itself in the environment, it should essentially interpret this as being no real change in the sensory input. However, if it displaces itself in the environment and there is a real change in the environment, like something distorts or gets replaced in the environment, then uh, the agent should uh, detect this. So this is the test we wanted to, we wanted to uh, provide the agent with. So to sh show that the agent can pass this first test, what we did is we presented the agent with a, a, a circle of stars here. Um, and this, for example, is what the output of one of the photoreceptors might be if it saw this circle <coughs> of stars. And then we had the agent jump. And during the jump, either we didn't change the circle of stars, we left it the same here, <coughs> or we did change it and we distorted it, we compressed the circle of stars. And we wanted to see would the agent realize that there had been this distortion or not. So this is what the agent sees at first before the jump. And then during, after the jump, it might see this or this. And actually what's interesting is that the distortion in what the agent sees is greater here in the case where there's a, a simple jump with no distortion in the sensory input. And it's, it, this one actually looks more similar to this than this one does. So you might, uh, just a metric that you calculated in the metric of the sensors would completely confound these two things. It would not be able to distinguish uh, them. It would make the mistake of thinking that there was less change here than there was here. But what we asked the agent to do was to try and find five functions that accurately map what, uh, what was before uh, to what was after. And we plot here the probability for this complex agent of, of, of detecting whether or not a change has occurred. And you see that that for, for large variations in the jump amplitude, when there's no stretching, no distortion of the actual uh, uh, starry landscape, the probability of saying that there's no distortion is near to one, but as soon as there's a bit of distortion, the agent sees it as being different. So the agent has passed this first test of spatial knowledge, which captures the one aspect of the notion that space is an unchanging vessel. So let's look at the second test. The second test captures another aspect of the notion of space, which we all seem to understand intuitively, which is sort of the notion of path. When I go from A to B, I know that I can get to B in many different ways by making detours, go from A to C to D and then back to B. I can do this in many different ways. And this is part of the kind of arithmetic of displacements that we know. And we know that this works even if the environment completely changes. Um, the, the existence of the notion of a path uh, is something that does not depend on what the environment consists of when I have the path. A path is something separate from the contents of the environment. And it's something independent of the agent and the environment. So we want to test whether the agent uh, has understood this. So what we did is we took our agent from an origin and we moved it first to a destination which we fixed um, in this two-dimensional space. <coughs> and we got it to remember that particular change. Not the visual change, but the proprioceptive change. And then we presented it with a number of different uh, paths that led either to the correct destination or to other destinations. And, and we did this changing the environment as it as it went, uh, uh, as it as it did this, so you could not say so. so the, the way the agent solves the problem cannot rely upon the visual content of the environment at the destination. Okay. So it's sort of like homing in ants 
It's sort of like pathfinding in ants or termites or whatever. And here is the result. We show that the probability that the agent correctly distinguishes that it has reached the correct destination, the reference destination, is, 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 is close to one when the, the end point is near the correct reference endpoint. But interestingly, as you increase the number of segments of the path that you take before you get to the uh, destination, the probability decreases. So it's sort of as though if you make a very long path with lots of segments, the agent kind of tends to get lost. So that seems very much very similar to the notion of path that we have. And so again, I consider that the agent has passed this test. Now let's look at a third test of uh, the notion of space. And this is the notion of displacement. So when we talk about space, an essential idea is the idea that um, there are objects. Objects have properties like color, size, shape. Um, and they have spatial aspects, namely their movement, their displacement, their relative position to other objects. And these two aspects of the sensory input are separate and can be distinguished and do not interact with each other necessarily. So we want to check whether this is really what the agent can understand. So to test the ability of the agent to abstract this out of the mass of sensory input that it gets, um, what we do is we present the agent with a uh, reference displacement. It's a movement of a set of stars to another set of stars, which produces uh, an a, a, a internal representation that looks like this going to this in the agent. And then we present it with a variety of other changes in uh, shifts in position using different shapes. And we want to see, can the agent understand that this shift going from here to here is actually the same and independent of uh, it, that it's actually the same shift as this shift going from here to here with the squares as this shift going from here to here with the triangles or for, to, with the stars. So it's able to abstract the notion of relative position independently of the uh, shape of the uh, entity. And what we find uh, in, the, in the results, again, is that uh, despite the large distortions and differences in the in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sensory input, uh, which, which would be completely confound any method that was based on the metric of the, in the sensor space, the agent is able to perfectly uh, judge the, the, the displacement. Okay, so the three tests of spatial knowledge that I think the agent has passed with flying colors here um, uh, seem to all participate in what I would say the notion of space as a vessel where um, uh, objects and the agent are independently uh, located and have loc notions of location with respect to each other. Um, these, three, th these three tests of spatial knowledge all make use of the fact that the agent has tabulated these functions phi. And the reason the functions phi are so important is that they correspond to these compensable transformations whose sensory uh, co consequences can be compensated either by a change in the agent or by a change in the environment. So they're shared. Now Helmholtz uh, has called compensable transformations rigid motions. They are rigid motions. This is what we mean by the concept of a rigid motion. Rigid motions are the most basic elements underlying the notion of space, precisely because they are shared between the environment and, and the agent. And they are independent of the intrinsic qualities of the, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the environment or the agent. And they only characterize the relationship, the spatial relationship between the agent and the environment. So as such, these rigid motions, um, they provide an economic description of sensory changes, much more economic description uh, then if you had to tabulate all the pixel changes in the sensory, in the sensory space. And they motivate the notion of vessel. And importantly, because they're based on sensory motor contingencies, which are intrinsic aspects of the, of the uh, in interaction of the agent with the environment, they're independent of the code used by the agent in, in its visual system or whatever. 
So in conclusion, I've shown how a naive agent can extract the notion of space as a vessel. Um, it's the method it uses is to study the sensory motor contingencies and functions phi that link them together. Um, it has essentially deduced the notion of rigid motion, uh, which is related to the notion of displacement, path, relative position. It allows these concepts to emerge from the sensory motor blooming buzzing confusion. It's independent of the agent, of the environment properties, and it's independent of sensory and motor codes. Now, this notion of a vessel, no notion of displacement, path, relative position, are only part of what we understand space to be. I think there are other aspects of space, for example, the notion of objects. Up until now, I haven't talked about what I mean by an object. I think further work has to be done to really nail down some kind of similarly intrinsic definition of what is meant by an object in the environment. And among the objects is the body of the agent. How can the, how can the agent understand its body and what the structure, the body schema is, is something also that from studying the sensory motor contingencies, I think we'll be able to uh, uh, extract. The notion of location also is something which we have not got. We have relative positions, uh, things relative to each other, but we don't have a metric at the moment in this, in this space. And we don't have a good measure of proximity. We don't have the notion of containment. We haven't defined notions of line and point, which seem to us to be, uh, after Euclid, seem to us to be so obvious. Uh, but they are not obvious at all in this sensory motor buzzing confusion. They have to be deduced somehow from the agent, and this is future work. Distance, size, and shape involve a metric, which we don't have yet for, for this approach. So that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, no, they can ask, uh, oh, okay. they can ask uh, uh, Alexander questions. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Uh, I, have a, I think I had a gap in, in understanding how you get, you have this sensory space, this eight-dimensional space. You get these maps, these dark maps. Is, is the map of, first of all, wh what is this map exactly showing? And second, how do you get the compensatory motion for that one? So... Yes. This map? Yeah, the, the, the map before that. But, but uh, how do you basically um, uh, find... No, th this one I understood. Yes, this one. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. what we are seeing here and how, how do we now get the, the concept of space from this? I'm, I, I think I didn't <laughs> get that one. Okay, so, so proprioception in this, for this agent is an eight-dimensional space. As the retina moves around, you get different activations in the proprioceptors these eight proprioceptors. So in this eight-dimensional space, because the retina can only move around in a two-dimensional space, there's going to be a two-dimensional manifold that, that corresponds to the possible positions of the retina in the, uh, in, I in, in the body of the agent. Okay? So I've unfolded from the eight-dimensional space, I've projected down that two-dimensional manifold, and that is what I'm showing here. So each point in here, is one, essentially one position of the retina inside the body. I don't have a metric for it, but I have the topology, at least, of the, uh, of the retinal positions within the body of the agent. How do you get that now? OK, so now what I'm going to do is shift the environment. And then I will search for shifts within that proprioceptive shape uh, space that compensate for the sensory change that, that was caused by my environment shift. So it's really a measure by measuring distance. Yes. There's no, there's no, di so I, I, I've got, so uh, let's see. Um, imagine that I'm the retina, and here are the lights. And uh, at the moment, I'm in this relative location with res respect to the light. Now, you shift, make some shift. Now ima imagine it's, it, the light has shifted from there to there, okay? Now I have to search for motions uh, that will compensate for that change. In other words, I have to find the, 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 uh, the, the proprioceptive change which allows me to go here 
where I am now in the same spatial relation to that to the light as I was before. Uh, so and, I will and you really search for them. Well, actually, what we do is we we just tabulate lots and lots and lots of changes, and then we in in the high dimensional space we just look. There's actually it's it's quite simple to do, but go and see uh, uh, Alexander at his poster, and he'll explain it in detail. Yeah, the next question is right here to the left. Um, so I think you said earlier that we have no a priori sense of space. Um, I think Kant would probably disagree with that. And, uh, but there's interesting new neuroscientific evidence showing that we do have certain built-in concepts, concepts of space. And I mean this new stuff about grid cells and place cells in the hippocampus, where it really things are just lighting up and a cog cognitive map seems to get dropped down into the room when we walk into it and we're being lit up as we move through it. So I'm wondering how that, in a way that's not that that's not really against what you're saying, but it's, I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, yeah, so that's why I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that what we were explaining is how an, an agent could adduce the notion of space either in phylogeny or in ontogeny. So my claim would be that, that what we have shown here is uh, uh, a characterization of space that applies either over evolutionary time or over developmental time. To follow up on this um, question that you asked me, I guess this is in fact a special case of data compression at work. You are using these functions phi as economic descriptors of the changes that you get as you're moving through it. Mm -hmm. And so our 3D, um, uh, from a data compression perspective, I think it's pretty clear that our um, uh, 3D world models <coughs> come from a data compression effort as we are getting a video uh, moving through a room there's one efficient way of compressing that video, which is create a 3D model of this world in which you're moving, and then you need to record only the X and Y position of the path and the angle. And from that, you can reconstruct the entire video. If there's noise, then you need a few extra bits to reconstruct the noise, but in principle, that's it. Mm -hmm. And it also, the same principle also would uh, answer what in you what? mentioned. Oh, the same principle would yeah. answer what you mentioned in the, in the conclusion of your talk. If there are certain other objects moving around, then the most efficient way of encoding the whole video is to give, to model these objects appropriately, and then just record mm -hmm. their X and Y positions as they are moving around. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the main uh, drive behind um, modeling the world as a 3D collection of objects, some of them fixed yeah. and some of them moving. Yeah. So all of this, I think, can in fact be uh, traced back to a data compression effort that the brain is achieving as it's um, uh, trying to compress the video that is coming right. in. Right, that's very much, I think, wouldn't you agree, uh, uh, Alexandra, that in fact that is sort of what we're trying to do. We're trying to show uh, how an agent in trying to understand, that is to say, compress or, or describe economically its sensory motor experience, how mm. it can do so. And what we're trying to show is how these functions phi mm. are a natural way of describing the sensory motor ex experience, and through through this economic description, mm -hmm. the notion of space actually falls out. Makes it's sense. a consequence of the effort to uh, to economically describe your sensory motor experience. So, we're one idea that I'm sort of toying with is that actually space, real physical space, Kantian real space, does not exist, mm -hmm. and that what happens is that brains have computational limitations, and that they try and make find order in the blooming buzzing confusion. And in order to best describe it, they invent this notion that they mm. call space. And that perfectly ties in with uh, all the machine learning literature on Occam's razor, where you always try to find the simplest model of the data, which in, which in that case yeah. is a 3D model. But I think there's something extra here in what we've done, which is that we really are relying on this Helmholtzian idea of compensation, Henri Poincaré, and later Jean Nico also studied uh, in detail this notion of compensability mm. and the understanding really what space is. Yeah. And space is something different and special, quite different from the normal kinds of data compression that you might get when you're trying to do object recognition, for example, or other sensory mm. tasks. I think there's but something magic mm. about space. But essentially, you are limiting the types of compressors that you're using. That's what, you, what is special here. So if you use a very super general uh, compressor, it's basically a method that searches among 
programs and the search of all, in the space of all possible programs, then these would be special cases. And you are limiting yourself already in the beginning to these shifting things and, and the homeworks inspired things, which is fine, which is good, but you know, it's, it's, it's a special case, I would say. Yes, I think mm. any compression algorithm uh, would, would come. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have a uh, question. You just said that space is not there, but I would say from, from what I understand here is that it is there because your your five functions is essentially the inverse of the of the uh, transfer function of your proprioception, right? So if you have the sum of proprioception from the space, you have a transfer function, and your pr uh, psi is simply the inverse of that. Something and in the in the one-dimensional space, it was monotonous, so it's easily invertible. In the multi in the high-dimensional space here, you can't do it. That's why you cannot get uh, the um, compensation movement right away, right? You have to search for it because there is no inverse. So. Uh, so is it uh, is it exactly that that you cannot then you that your uh, proprioceptive function needs to be monotonous to to get to get back to the original space or uh, are there other other constraints? Alexander, will you answer? I'm trying to understand what you are saying. So you started from saying that space is actually there. Well, yes and no. I mean, like, I I if you try to explain it in a few words, it's something like this. But we're not really inverting anything. We are just um, finding some useful mappings uh, in some new space, which, uh, which is produced by the sensations. So if, for example, the agent was living not in a real 2D space, but it was living in the space of, I don't know, sounds or colors, you could equally discover something like rigid transformation and would also think that there is something like space, but it wouldn't be what we used to think to be <coughs> space. Okay, Humphrey. Yeah, so um, from the neuroscientific point of view, this reminds me very much to the idea of gain fields from Pouget, Deneuve and colleagues, that you have mappings between different representations or the invariant representations here in the context that you have, have a recurrent connectivity that also you can read out missing values, for example, spatial position. Did you ever think about that? I know a bit about what Puget has done. <coughs> and uh, yes, there are mappings, but what is your point exactly? No, it's, it's a kind of variant of this idea, I think. Uh, my, my understanding of Puget is he has these basis functions that allow him to do coordinate transformations between different uh, different sensory modalities. Um, yeah, it's coordinate tra transformation, and here you don't give in um, the your spatial position only uh, when you when you have the proprioception, yes. but not the spatial position of the agent. Yes. But you can also, in if you have a recurrent network, you can then read out this missing value. Possibly, maybe there's a relation, but I think that what's really critical here and that's absent in the Puget stuff and, and, and most other things, is this idea of compensability. And the idea that we really are, uh, we're really extracting a sort of understanding or notional concept. It seems to me that, that you're showing how an abstract concept is essentially instantiated in, in, in this agent by doing this particular, well, Jürgen says compression, or this particular kind of analysis coincidence analysis. I suppose it's related. Yeah, but it's an invariant mapping, I would say. But yeah, invariant mapping, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is a real question uh, because um, you're, you said your agent is jumping in this two-dimensional environment, um, but apparently it doesn't have any proprioception or motor system for doing the jump. Right. So okay, it is not. But it could be, right? <laughs> it could have some inaccurate uh, right, notion of where it like is, this, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yes, that would be something to add in later. Yeah. But I mean, we're taking an extreme case here. Okay. I think what's important here is that 
the agent must be able to make some form of rigid motion of its own through the motion of its senses. Mm -hmm. And that that rigid motion has a mirror, essentially, in, a, in the rigid motions that the environment can make. And it's that possibility of doing something that can be shared with the environment that allows it to give it a common ground, which gives it this notion of space. Space is this shared thing between what the agent can do and what the environment can do. And it's this that allows an economic description of, of, of sensory changes in the case of rigid transformations. Okay, but uh, can it still put, um, consider paths which go outside the, the range of the, of the retina? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something that we've been thinking about trying to work on how it could extend its spatial knowledge beyond its own proprioceptive possibilities. It's very nice to have this consensus on compression as a mechanism to bring out the characteristics of space. And that may bring into view a successor question because one can compress uh, depending differently depending on what one is interested in. If one is interested in preserving metric distances, one would probably very much uh, do it in the way you prescribed it, but there are several concepts of space, there are also metric spaces and there are topological spaces. So one can be more modest and say, I do not want to preserve Euclidean distances. I'm uh, satisfied if I'm just preserving the ordering uh, of spaces, which then uh, induces a kind of, in data mining, they call it non-metric em embeddings, which uh, yield different types of mappings and ultimately topology, if one only thinks in terms of connectivity. I wonder, um, uh, to what extent um, uh, this enables to decide what our psychological space uh, resembles, which of these space concepts, and probably it's a mixture containing elements uh, from uh, each of them. Exactly. So that's, so that's sort of our idea, namely that uh, we ha we're not aiming for any particular representation of space or any particular kind of space. We've done a particular uh, thing, namely we've tabulated cases where uh, we get identical sensory values across hop, uh, uh, these hops. And uh, this gives us these phi functions, and then these phi functions can be used to do these spatial tests. But what, what is the kind of space, what is the notion of space that the agent really has? Is it topology, is it metric, is it Euclidean? You know, uh, th these questions we have not yet answered. But we Maybe Probably, uh, to, to comment on the compensation, uh, the, the metric that uh, makes your compensation is probably the essential thing because everything is with infinite accuracy. And when you say, oh, it's compensated, but I ignore the following kinds of deviations, you can bring in probably very interesting variants. Alexander. Uh, the metric for your co uh, compensation always means uh, uh, contains a metric. You compare whether you have undone to a def sufficient degree. And if that metric is blind to certain uh, differences, then you do a different compensation than when the metric is blind to others. And so the structure of this metric probably is very constitutive of the type of space you extract. Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, in fact, we we use it currently, and it's implemented in the computer as a metric, which is uh, derived from the from the particular responses of the receptors. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with external spaces. Mm -hmm. Pure the metric in the space of the sensors. Uh, but uh, what we really use is topology. We do not use metric. We just uh, require sufficient closeness of a metric. Mm -hmm. So we we say if if the sensation coincides with the previous one then mm -hmm. here it is. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, if you go, if you assume that you can uh, perform infinite number of experiments, uh, then you even don't need the topology. You need just precise coincidence of cases. Yeah, but usually sensors are noisy. Yes, yeah, we ignore the noisiness. We are in purely deterministic world. Yes, when the noises come, you are absolutely correct. You, you must somehow introduce some probable metric that would uh, tell you that these noises should be ignored while those should be not correct. Okay. Um, I, I wonder whether it is of any significance for your setup that you're using these hops. 
So nothing happens in between. There is a sensory input there and a sensory there. So it, I wonder why you're choosing this. It looks like the natural thing would be to have something that's continuous and that's continuously producing inputs. Yeah, yeah actually, I think that could that might be a, a way of increasing the accuracy uh, uh, of the or increasing the, s the facility of generating these phi functions. Yes, perhaps. What do you think, Alexandra? The true reason is that we don't want to have time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is, and uh, you know, following Augustine, I don't know, the more you think about it, the less clear it is. And uh, uh, I mean, like uh, what uh, Nihat showed us today, it seems that currently, at least in computer science community, there is a shift from classical continuous representation to more like discrete time representation, because it's just somehow easier to deal with it, I guess. And so that's exactly the reason why we have hops rather than Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you.